Okay, we're going to take a look at Wild Blue Yonder. This is uh, from the Down in Flames series. This is uh, kind of the newest incarnation. It's a replacement really for the original Down in Flames, uh, Rise of the Luftwaffe, and 8th Army, and I don't know what else after that. It probably includes the fighter packs I picked up recently. But I figure, hey, extra planes are useful, even if they don't quite fit in. It's just kind of useful to have. Um, from myself, my own history with this is kind of interesting. Uh, I, I bought the original Down in Flames Rise of the Luftwaffe. And I really liked it. I really liked it. But I had a friend in the area who liked it maybe even more than I did and he picked up the 8th Air Force and between us we had like you know something cool <laughs> but the truth of the matter was you know it's not a game that plays very well solitaire and I figured look you know as long as we're in the same area I can I can play with you, so one of us should have both of them. I didn't want both of them, he did. So I sold him my uh, uh, my first edition, uh, Rise of the Luftwaffe, for about what I paid for. Like, you know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I can part with it for what I paid for. I regretted selling it. It's, uh, I think, the only game that I didn't have a duplicate of that I sold. And... I have regretted it ever since. So, <laughs> and that was one of my lessons of don't sell games, especially things you like. But, uh, no, it, it's not the only thing that I regretted selling. I sold uh, all, all my Middle Earth uh, RPG stuff. Uh, all, all, not, not, some of it was Middle Earth, but it was uh, Rollmaster, Middle Earth campaign source material and that stuff uh, again I sold uh, for about what I paid for it and apparently I was kind of scammed by that. <laughs> uh, the buddy of mine who, who was offering to buy it uh, he you know made huge book on it because the books were selling for significantly more um, than they originally sold for. But again, in that case, I, I was thinking, geez, I, I'm not going to run Rollmaster again. But the buddy who actually bought uh, <laughs> my Down in Flames was really upset because he wanted to play in a Middle Earth campaign uh, in Rollmaster, which I had run a couple of and didn't like. Anyway, fast forward. The next time I really see the game, uh, I picked up Zero. It used to be it used to be on these shelves when they were in a different room in a different state. But uh, I picked up Zero, and I may have picked up some other uh, things from the series. And I was planning on picking up the, uh, down in uh, the Rise of the Luftwaffe and the 8th Air Force, but they were always very expensive. And this is the replacement for it. That's why I got this. Uh, and part of the reason I picked them up and wanted them again was I thought my wife would like them. Well, we never got around to playing any of them. <laughs> um, and, but, and, and it may be why I pre-ordered on this. But on the other hand, I, I do really like it, and, you know, if I ever get to game with someone or with a couple of people, it's, it's a lot of fun. And then, uh, when I was in Phoenix, uh, at Concept World, there was a guy, and I can't remember his name, um, th th there was this uh, guy who, who ran a campaign of it every year at, at Consum World, and unfortunately he's passed, but uh, um, he, he put a lot of work in, and you know, you had to play so many fights, and, and you collected points for it, and, and you could win, you know, 
the campaign o over the course, and you could pop in and out, you know, while you were playing other big games and whatnot. Um, and I played a few hands there uh, for a couple of years. I wasn't really into, you know, competing in it. Uh, for, first of all, I was usually not there for more than like a weekend. Maybe two weekends. Sometimes it was it covered both of them, whatever. But I, I usually wasn't there during the week. Um, anyway, uh, he he did a really great thing, and I got to see some of I I got to see sort of previews of some of the stuff that was coming into into this. Um. So that was kind of cool. Now I'm gonna go into the rules. Uh, I've just reread them. And I'm kind of familiarized. Uh, all I've read is the dogfight rule book. I will go over another rule set if, and I expect I will, I do some of the campaign stuff, which involves all these materials here um, to track stuff along this line. Uh, the original game came with scenarios that were just dogfight scenarios. And that's fine. Uh, this one does not. It comes with a, a different mechanism for you for you to handle that. You've got uh, little cards for all the different planes in the game, and there's a whole lot now. And then each player has. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go into the rules, but if you want to learn the game to play it or whatever, don't don't follow my rules. Somebody else has done a better job, I'm sure, uh, for that. This is really for the context of you know, the coverage that I'm going to give across the board. Wow. Uh, it's hard to dig deep into these. So, one thing that's changed in the game is that each player has their own, or each side has their own deck of cards now. It used to be they shared a deck of uh, uh, cards. And that sort of switches things up because I think some people complained because there were cards that there was like only one of that were really, really Im impressive. Like, you know, shoot down the enemy plane all at once, really cheaply, right? And you could draw one of, if you drew that, then the other player knew you didn't have, you know, that that wasn't in the deck anymore. And there weren't any kind of special re reshuffle rules, although those, you know, sometimes people had house rules. Once that was played, you know, at the end of that turn or whatever, reshuffle. Um, these are, wow, speaking of components, all the cards are the very, very stiff, sort of high-end GMT cards. I've had issues with these kind of cards in terms that, like, they can get damaged more easily. I, Look, it doesn't matter how, how thick and hard and powerful the cards are if you're putting them in plastic, probably, right? If you're, if, if you're dropping them in a, in a card condom. But if you're playing them normally, I've found that the sturdiness and stiffness of these cards is actually somewhat problematic. Uh, I prefer the, the flexible cards. I was almost certain this would be the case, though. Um, in addition to this rule book, you have a campaign rule book that goes over all that. These cards are going to be either different kind of maneuver cards or firing cards. Uh, one thing about this game, if you've watched my attack sub video, there's a lot about this game that feels similar to attack sub. <laughs> Now, nobody is publishing Attack Sub. It, it's a really cool game, actually. But I think this is sort of derivative from it. I haven't looked up to make sure that Attack Sub came first. But, yeah. Um, and, and basically what happens is each player is going to play, uh, on their turn, a sequence of cards to try to jostle in the maneuvering uh, to get a good shot in. And, you know... I do a lot of World War One air, or I own a lot of World War One air games. I don't play them a lot on video because, again, usually they don't sell all that well. And and this doesn't really either. It's not it's not primarily a game. It's not a game that I would generally put forward as solo. And neither is a tax sub. They're fun games that uh, these guys, uh, this and the tax sub, 
are fairly light and easy games to learn and, and, and play with people that don't require a hell of a lot of, of detail in the rules and whatnot. Um, <laughs> the World War I games, I'm more interested in the detail. This is World War II. I have a few World War II air games more than I used to, but uh, it, it, this is actually sort of the perfect level for me on World War II air games. And I think they did a World War I uh, type of game off of this. I'm not absolutely certain. I never picked it up because I always wanted more out of World War I. And honestly, I mean, I picked up Zero, I think I got it used, or on sale or something. And I was kind of like, well, I like this system, yeah, I want to collect it again. Um, but the truth of the matter is, this just does not solo, and whatever. Anyway, <laughs> alright. So, each player is going to have... Let's see if we get a couple of the same... See, these are bombers. We don't want bombers. Each player is going to have... Uh, the bombers are basically used in the campaign game. Up, uh, okay, this is not good. These are both wingmen. I gotta find. I gotta find uh, the proper proper cards. I, I, I thought they would have them paired. See, I was really happy about the insert. Not everything fits well. The game box was pretty full to begin with. I'm still in the same point as, as I was, but it's almost impossible to get the the cards out once you get behind beyond these little things. Um, so I'm gonna have to put the cards in bags anyway. And once I have to do that. I'm thinking I just want to get the insert out of here because it's really kind of a waste. I thought it was great, you know, I was like, oh, cool. And they come out perfectly fine when they're in their plastic, but as soon as they're out of the plastic and playable, you don't want this stupid insert anymore. And I don't, I don't know how I'm going to even get these out except by flipping the box over, basically. So now I got them out. Um, all right, so here is a plane. The front side shows its normal side of the plane. The back side shows its damaged side. It's got a number of different pieces of information on it. We're just going to look at the fighters for now. Others are going to have other pieces to them. Now, you have your power. That's going to be the size of your hand, essentially. You have uh, horsepower. That is how many cards you're allowed to draw each turn. This is your victory point. Over here it indicates sort of how stable a firing platform it is, how easy it is to maneuver into a shot. Um, you're essentially from the neutral position able to fire a zero burst from this plane, which means that you will not be able to fire without gaining some sort of uh, uh, positional advantage. This gives the height ceiling that the plane has. Uh, this is the number of hits that the plane takes before it gets flipped over to a reduced side. You keep those hits on the plane. Those are going to be marked with these these little markers. You also have altitude markers somewhere on here. Very high. I'll sort those out later. I just want to get the the rules done while I've got some raid playing by itself. This is the total hits the plane will take. And then you can see here, we've got reduced values. So the 7 went down to a 5, the 3 went down to a 2. When the plane is damaged, it takes more. Now, this is the designation of the plane. I don't know what the dash 1 slash 2 is. I'm assuming that's part of the name of the plane. Uh, and the date that the plane shows up basic type of plane it is. And then, and I'm going to have to sort the cards to get uh, the right thing, but each plane also comes with a match, a wingman, who will be flying along with your plane. Now, unfortunately, they don't have them sorted in that fashion. So I don't know you know, like here, here's a uh, different. Yeah, I'm 
minus dash two to dash four. I think this is dash one or two, not dash one half. So I would have to dig through here to find the pro appropriate wingman to go with this plane. But I'm going to explain what the wingman has. They have basically an offensive and defensive number, which is going to be how many um, how many points of uh, how how many cards they draw in those rolls. In general, your wingman's just supporting the main fighter, and each each player is going to have a fighter and a wingman in play. This indicates the bombing capability, I believe. I know this down here says it's a bomber, but the one level, um, I think, is that. I don't recall. Yeah. And that's not going to be something we're going to cover in this rule book. That's the campaign rules. It used to, it used to be everything was in one rule book. Uh, I'm trying to remember... I think bombing didn't even come into play until 8th Air Force, where they added the campaigns, and now they've segmented the campaigns out into their own rule book, uh, where you're going to have goals and whatnot to reach and, and to take advantage of. And it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do them in just fighter scenarios. Basically, if you're not allocating your bombers with protection and whatnot uh, to various scenarios, it, it just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. The campaign adds a lot. It adds pilot experience, which was in the original game um, and has been pulled out. Uh, yeah. I am going to need to sort these fuckers, uh, which probably means that I take a break from this and go do that, uh, because I want to be able to demonstrate uh, what's going on and whatnot. The question is, can I give you the rules without, uh, without uh, sorting, sorting the cards? I think the answer is yes, so I'm going to try that. All right, let me swap batteries. So, the basic flow of the game, you set it up, and each player is kind of randomly, well, one player from, all, all the players kind of randomly select who, who's going to be the first player. And then second player is going to be from the other side, also kind of at random. And you just alternate, you know, back and forth. Quite often you can just do it, you know, ordered on, on the table or whatever. It doesn't really make much difference. And uh, you select the, the planes by the point value on the planes in general. It's the balance value. If a scenario, you know, if you want to balance a scenario, um, you look for, like this would be a four point plane. If you look at, I don't have his wingman, but the wingman for this other plane adds one to the value of, for the pair. And that way you can, you know, kind of allow for, uh, uh, differences in player qual capabilities and whatnot. Uh, when the campaign was being run at CSW, we had new planes coming in and everything. <laughs> I wasn't playing seriously enough ever to really, like I had a pilot in it, uh, but you know, I, I, I wasn't playing seriously enough that it really mattered in terms of, I would sometimes get a better plane but I wasn't, you know, really paying too much attention. And, you know, the, the planes keep up with each other, so you have that. Um, but for the scenarios played in here, uh, basically they're going to be a six-turn dogfight in, in general. Now, and each player secretly selects their altitude uh, for, for it. Basically, you have one player, in general, you'll have one player per pair, of, uh, per uh, fighter and wingman pair is the best way to play this. It's the most fun. <laughs> you could be playing multiple planes per player. Obviously, uh, if I'm going to be doing any of the campaign stuff or anything, I'm going to be doing that. And in fact, I'm probably going to be playing two planes per player for the first, 
you know, for, for the demonstration. Because the game is not that interesting when you're playing just one pairing to one pairing. I'll pause and relight. I went shopping recently. Um, it's dead of night, of course. That's why I'm down here and not playing the other game upstairs. Uh, um, and I just, I did not uh, get anything. Like, I didn't get any treats for myself. I got some bagels, which is kind of nice. But it's like, I, I have, I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to keep my load light. So I got the necessities, which for me is sandwich food for the most part, and, you know, some stuff for pasta, but that's it. Uh, and I'm just kind of miserable because I, I wanted stuff. Anyway, I don't know why I'm babbling about that here in the middle of the rules, but... All right, so each player on their turn has a number of steps they take. The first is the wingman step. If you have a wingman, you can have them do an action against either the enemy... So... There's some concepts that I haven't hit yet, but against an enemy plane. Now, the concepts I haven't gotten to is engaged. Each pair of planes, the, the fighter and wingman, can be in a situation where they're already engaged by another plane, by, an, by another pair of planes. And the wingman is basically restricted if you are engaged to fighting one of the engaged planes. If you're not engaged, he can just fly off on his own and do something, uh, sort of. Anyway, what happens with the wingman when they take an action is they draw a little mini hand, and like I said, they have an offense and a defensive number. They'd be attacking, so they just draw one card. They declare a, uh, an opponent, which might be limited to some to either the fighter or wingman that they're engaged with. They draw a hand equal to what they have, and then they can take an action based on that card. If it has a maneuver action and you're already engaged, it can impact the maneuvering. Uh, it, it can impact the positional status of, of the planes involved. If it has a, a fire action, it can just shoot the enemy and presumably might do some damage to them. However, this is a response card. This cancels anything out. I bet it's they're in the same order here. No. <laughs> this is a, a firing card. And uh, I'll explain this briefly while we're here. So it's an In My Sights card. It's a type of card that allows you to fire. It requires two bursts, uh, which is, remember, there's a zero burst here. I wouldn't be able to meet that because I don't have two, so I wouldn't be able to fire this. It gives you how many uh, attacks it has. And then everything gives you some bombing information here in terms of uh, uh, what happens. Which we don't, we're not going to touch those rules. Okay. Um, okay. So your wingman draws his little mini, he declares his target, he draws his little mini hand, maybe he does something. In this case, I wouldn't be able to do anything on attack. This is just a response card, so I just discard it. If I had drawn this, I would be able to say, ah, I've got you in my sights. Wingman doesn't worry about bursts, and I would have this attack come off. And if the other player didn't have a counter like the ace pilot, uh, <laughs> I would hit them and I would do two hits and I'd add two to their hit total. Then you're allowed, you hit the altitude step. Now this removes the clouds marker, which is a new thing in the game. Um, new for me at least. Although it was present at the, uh, the last time I played at CSW. Last time I played. Um, and then you're allowed to adjust your altitude. In general, you can adjust it by one level. If you're climbing, you have to lose cards. If you're diving, you gain cards. Um, in addition, though, it puts, if you're engaged with someone, it can break that engagement off. But if the other person has an advantage over you, or is tailing, to use the technical terms, but I consider that an advantage too, um, they're allowed to follow you on whatever uh, maneuver you take. There might be costs, though. 
Then you're on your leader step. Like I said, you're going to have a hand of cards. So, this may be stupid, but let's say I have this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cards are sticky. Seven. So this might be my hand of cards. And again, I'll have a wingman of the same type of plane. Always the same same pattern. There may be some kind of rules to allow mixed plane types, but that would confuse me. And it's not in this game. <sighs> okay. So I'd have this hand of cards, and what I'm allowed to do is to try to use maneuver cards to um, improve my position on an enemy plane and then conceivably I could use fire cards to get an attack in. And by improving my position, right now I have a zero burst, but improving your position you get more bursts. So if you're advantaged on an enemy plane, you get plus one burst on it, which means I'd be allowed to, over the course of my turn, play a single burst on them. If I can get it up to tailing, I go to a total of plus three to my burst value, which would allow me to play this big card that does three hits. Now, the colors of the cards are important. Blue are only allowed for you to um, make an attack. Uh, sorry, I'm making a mistake here. White are only allowed to attack, right? I don't remember. Maybe it's the outline. Um, I'm not remembering the coloring here. Yeah, this is why you want to want to deal with someone else, right? For the rules. Um, I mean, very clearly it says attack here, so yeah, this would not be a response in any sense of the word. So yeah, an attack card allows you to launch, um, to start an attack on someone. And that can include, like this, which is a maneuver card, which allows me to improve my position by one, or gain an extra burst against a wingman or a formation aircraft. I'll explain fighting against uh, <laughs> the wingman in a little, I, I mean, I'll give, go into more specifics on everything. But this is only a response card. This can only be played against either in my sights, tight turn, or maneuver. So if somebody had played a maneuver card to improve position on me, I could play this to be able to cancel that card out. And that's what the defender's hand is. The defender, if it's the fighter plane, has a hand of cards already that he can use as response to, to use his responses. So this card could cancel out either um, the initial, uh, I'm sorry, this card could cancel out either the maneuver card which would improve the burst rating, or it could be used to cancel out uh, the In My Sights attack card. It can't be used to cancel out an Out of the Sun card because that's not listed down here. I think this was always the case. I think it was always very clear on the cards what you could uh, do with each card. That's one of the big bonuses of the game is that it was very easy to play. You just got a handful of cards, you, you, you could be given a few rules, and, and then you could just kind of play it, right? That, that's the beauty of it, and that's why I say somebody else explaining the rules is better if you're trying to learn to play, because uh, I'm kind of blundering through it, and still, you know, still trying to relearn the game. Why are you doing the intro now? Because I always do the intro first. It helps me uh, consolidate the rules in my own head. And it also, you know, shows some of the impact here. Okay. Um, anyway, during the, uh, during the leader step, you're going to play a series of cards, presumably trying to improve your position and or get a shot off on the enemy. Then you're allowed to discard as many cards as you like. Um, and only the top card is visible. 
Nobody can look through through the the decks to see what's gone or not. So you kind of have to remember. Which might be important. There are some, some very rare cards. And then you're allowed to draw cards basically equal to your horsepower rating, which can be modified by altitude and other things, um, up to your performance in hand. Now, it's important because sometimes you're, you're, you can have your hand size, you can have your hand size, you can have a larger hand than your performance rating, even than your modified performance rating. And that's allowable. You're just not allowed to draw more cards in that case, <laughs> unless you discard down below it. Now, after everybody takes their turns, you go to a final step, um, which in this game is simply you mark the turn marker up. And that's only really important because dogfights are limited to six turns by the scenario rules for this. They could go longer if you want it, you know. Uh, it probably doesn't make sense to say fly it as long as you possibly like. Eventually, the planes are going to run out of fuel. So the six turns is kind of a nice compromise. You can probably, you know, in almost any case, you're going to have enough fuel to, once you engage the enemy, to fight the six turns, uh, presumably. But, you know, the game doesn't really track that. But it might, in the campaign game, and I don't remember how it handles this, but it might have... You know, one player is allowed, must break off, or certain planes have to break off after a certain amount of time or something like that. And it could be different for each. I could easily see that kind of mechanism in play. Can't guarantee you it's there. Okay. So that's the basic uh, flavor of it. And then they go over how, how you set up. Uh, everybody has a handful of cards equal to their performance at the beginning of the game. Uh... You could work rules in optional rules like a mulligan or something like that if you don't like like what you have. Uh, that I thought that used to be in the rule book, and I don't see it here. Um, I know I know at CSW we played uh, or CSWE we we played with mulligan rules. Uh, basically, you discard your hand if you don't like it, and you get a hand with one card less. So, you know, it's not optimal, but if you have a shitty ass hand at the, the, the beginning and the way he implemented it, and I don't remember if this was the base rule, was that actually happened um, as the play orders determined. So play order is kind of interesting. On the first turn of the game, you randomly select one player who's the first player, right? They then take their turn, and if there's a mulligan, they get it at that point. Then the second player is, I believe, randomly selected from the next side? No. No, no, no. You randomly select which side goes first, and they pick one of their, one of their fighter uh, uh, wingman pairs to go first. And that player takes their entire turn. Um, I think you were allowed to call the mulligan either. It's not in the rules, so I, and I'm not going to play with it in this, but I think you were allowed to call the mulligan either when you were selected as a target or when it was your go. Which, again, I... I don't know. Um, so victory for the game. Basically, each fighter that you destroy gets you five victory points. Each uh, fighter uh, of the enemy side, obviously, that's either damaged or disengaged voluntarily before the end of the six turns gets you two victory points. And one side or the other just gets a win based on that. Um, some of the fighters are going to have a gunner associated to them? And that appears to be in the bomb position. I don't know 
Let me see if I can find one that has a gunner. You would think this would. Maybe not. I don't know my planes very well. But I thought the lightning was big enough. Let me see if I can find an example. These big guys here have turrets, but that I don't think is the gunner position. Um, so let me keep looking, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying pretty hard to find an example where gunner is covered, which I think is different from turrets, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, I was thinking maybe it's this number here, but no, this, this is a level bomber with one point of bombing capability. <laughs> I looked that up in the campaign rules. I haven't gone through every damn card yet, but the only things I see here are uh, strafe boxes, which are like bombing. They're for campaign game only. These turrets, which have their own separate rule set from uh, gunners. Now, you would think, well, where do you put the gunner except in a turret? Um, you might put a gunner... So we've got gunner attacks here and firing. Uh, somewhere they had turrets. Uh, I'm getting pissed off at this thing. Like, I wish they had showed an example with a gunner on it, because you never use bombs. Um... Maybe it's indicated here. This is why my rules or <laughs> explanations are valuable. Because they do show you, you know, the difficulty in coping. And, you know, here I am, somebody who knows the game, but I don't think I've ever played one with a gunner in it. And we're looking here, let's look, gunner. Some are equipped with gunners as well. Gunners protect. Gunner acts like a burst rating, limiting... While this, that, the other, it's not there. So here I have this turret defense one star, turret support zero. This is not anything like what's described in the, in this uh, rule book. So I think it's campaign rules for the for the turrets there. Um, and the only thing I can say is. I can't find something that just has gunner listed on it, but I know that there aren't concepts of defense or support on the turrets, on the gunner rolls, right? There's no, no division of, of capability or anything like that. So this is for formation flying, which is a completely different role. I'm going to keep looking, I guess, but I'm getting really pissed off because I'm trying to play right upstairs and expending fucking resources while I look here and this does not give me what I need for this scenario at all. It has a, uh, not this one, this one. So this has a picture which shows bomb and gunner and they both point to this stupid little bomb here which means nothing, right? <laughs> it's this and this. Uh, so this, this differentiates it from torpedo bombers and whatnot, which have their own, own special rules. So if it has a torpedo, it uses a different kind of bombing rule. But it also says gunner here. Uh, and that points to that same little bomb. Both of these point to this, which is not all that useful, right? <laughs> and certainly this is not the gunner. The gunner is not a bomb, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll be back down, but I'm getting very, very frustrated with what this is trying to represent um, here. Uh, the rules were, were simple enough for someone who knows the game already uh, to kind of skim through and, and, and tell you what they are. I, I have gotten nothing that tells me what I should look for here at all. Not yet. I even am cutting into here to look in the extended example of play. It doesn't show anything different from what we've looked at. It doesn't show anything with a gunner on it. That was just sort of a gosh I hope that I'll have it. 
but yeah, I, I don't fucking see it. <sighs> so this has really gone uh, south real fast <laughs> over, over this roll. Um, what I may do, I mean, I, I've been fucking searching through the cards for something that looks different from the turret and from the gunner, and I'm not fucking seeing it. And I'm getting really frustrated because this is the time that I have right now to do the rules. And that's all I'm fucking doing. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, there's nothing in it that shows it except for these turrets. And the turrets are not, as far as I can tell, gunners. Let's look at the turret rolls. Where did we find them? We found something with turrets. Like, that was different from gunner. Something distinguished turret from gunner. Because it would make perfect sense if the gunner was the turret. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. The gunner rating. Acts like a burst rating limiting the in my in limiting the in my sights or out of the sun. That can be played the difference is when the burst rating applies when your leader is neutral, advantage or tailing. Yeah. I mean the idea of the gunner is they can shoot out the sides and back, basically. So, if you don't have the advantage on the opponent, you're allowed to shoot. I'm beginning to think that the turret is what's supposed to be there, but I thought I saw a fucking rule that distinguished turrets from gunners. And now I can't find it. So here's our clue. The BF-110 has a gunner rating of 1. So now I have to search through all the planes to find a BF-110 to see if it has a turret on it. Because, or, or how it expresses that gunner rating. What I'm thinking is something like the Bristol, right? Where it's not in a fucking turret. It's a dude with a, a, a swivel machine gun. You know? <laughs> So here's a BF-110C, and it does not have anything that indicates a gunner. We'll keep looking. We'll see if there's just a BF-110 without a C on it, because maybe they put the gunner aside to put a bomb in there or something. No, it's right here, right in front of me. It says gunner. Not where the picture pointed. Picture said... What did picture say? Oh, maybe this line. Ah, there it is. There it is. This line is invisible to me. There is a gunner on that plane. How about that? Well, that was a hell of a lot of work for just because of picture. I, because I can't see this dark line. They should have done something so that it trailed under or something. That pisses me off, man. <laughs> that pisses me off. No doubt. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's where the gunner shows up. Shows up under the burst rating. Not over near the bomb where it looks like this is pointing. Okay. Well, <laughs> remember, watch somebody else's video if you want to learn how to play. Um, yeah, I'm pissed as all hell now. All right. I'll, I'll go, uh, go set up my raids on auto so I can come back down. Okay, so we have finally gotten through all of what the cards represent. And, uh, there's a couple of little, uh, minor things here. Some guns 
I'll have a heavy gun number notation. I'm not going to even look this up. If I don't see an HG on it, I'm, if I don't see something I don't understand, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and this will be markers that you put on... They're in here somewhere. I need to sort these too before I play. But again, I wanted to get to the rules because I can't, uh, I've got Raid playing on its own upstairs. I want to be able to do something towards the board games, uh, even if it's absolute shit like this is turning out to be. But anyway, um, you put, uh, you put markers on there and there are a certain number of times that you get extra, extra firepower essentially. We'll get to that. Um, ceiling we've already vaguely talked about. There's an altitude marker on the plane. You can't go above your ceiling. Um, sometimes damaged planes will have a lower ceiling than the undamaged version. I'm not going to look for that. Uh, bombing and strafing is not used. The balance value is the number. This is how, how you, you know, come up with your point values. Y you could conceivably add an ace or something to try to match things out. Again, aces are in the campaign game only. Uh, jets. Jets have different ratings. I'm not going to look for them. They have speed ratings, which is a number of full throttle counters that they're allowed to use. These are basically extra maneuver capabilities. They're the equivalent to a full throttle card and allows you to do whatever a full throttle card allows you to do. Um, and we'll get into what the different cards actually allow in a bit without pawing through them. Um, and like the heavy gun, there's something you expend and get rid of. Um, now, like your hand of cards, right, you have a, uh, what do you have? You have a performance, which is your hand of cards, and a horsepower, which is the number of cards you get to draw every turn. Your speed is the number of full throttles you start the game with, but your thrust is how many full throttles counters you get back every turn. So jets are going to have an additional maneuver capability just baked into them um, when you fight with them. Of course, they're going to come in very late in the, the war and we probably won't see very many because I probably will not play a hell of a lot of this. Like, I may get through, I may do a campaign, but <laughs> I don't know. Because I just don't know how much fun it's going to be to play out the scenarios um, uh, solo. But I'm thinking I may play them out solo without videoing everything, which might be kind of cool. Uh, okay. Wingmen, they have the same damage ratings on their planes as uh, a non-wingman plane would have. And they're equivalent, and that's kind of important because whatever damage a wingman has, if your main fighter goes down, the wingman will replace it. Uh, their combat ratings... Uh, we didn't go into the effects of altitude on the leader ratings. Here we go. Okay. So horsepower, at low or very low altitude, you get an additional horsepower because the air is thicker and the little propeller can catch it better. I wonder if that's true with jets as well. It looks like it is. At medium altitude, your horsepower stays the same. At high, you lose one horsepower unless you're turbocharged. At very high, you lose two horsepower, but you only subtract one if turbocharged. Um, horsepower, remember, is the number of cards you're allowed to draw. Okay. Now, for the wingman, they have... Um, their combat ratings, at high altitude and very high altitude, they lose a point. Well, at high altitude, they lose a point from their defensive rating. At um, very high altitude, they lose one from both offense and defense. 
Remember, their offense and defense is a combination of maneuver cards and uh, fire cards, but in a way, it's the same same for the, the, the main fighter, right? The number of cards you draw, if it's getting reduced, you're not getting as much offense as well as as much defense. So it's kinda, it kind of matches that. When you're at higher altitudes, your wingman's not going to be able to do as much for you. Uh, wingmen can have heavy guns. They start with the markers in that case. Their ceiling is going to be the same. And then they have a modifier to the balance, which is just added to the points. The pair has both things. Now, it's possible to play where, you know, like one, one plane doesn't have a wingman or something like that just for balancing the scenario or whatever. And obviously the campaign can generate situations as well. Some planes have some special stuff. If they're rated as agile, once during their own turn they can treat any card as if it's a scissors card. Unlike other fighters, an agile aircraft engaged with a dive bomber may follow it when it dives. That's a campaign thing. Normally, the campaign stuff is this pale gray. The little red marks are changes from, I guess, Zero's rules, the most recent of, of the original. The originals were done by Dan Verson. This is uh, a different designer who's taken it over. I guess GMT had the rights to Down in Flames, but... But they never reprinted it itself, so I don't know. <laughs> Things might have been weird. Uh, multi and single engine. I'm ignoring this because it's just informational, the carrier aircraft. Um, all fighters are single-engined unless they say multi-engine. Multi-engine planes are not automatically shot down by an engine hit card. And uh, bombers are multi... Uh, the medium and heavy bombers are multi-engine and less marked otherwise. Some aircraft have methanol or alcohol uh, or, or nitrous... Uh, injection system that increases their speed for a limited time. Each leader and wingman gets a full throttle counter at the beginning of the mission. It's lost and no longer available when the aircraft is damaged. It's a one use uh, full throttle. So they turn into sort of like jets for a little while. They're allowed to use that extra full throttle card essentially. Turret fighter leaders may attack other... Here, here's where it is. And yes, turrets are not gunners. Turret fighter leaders may attack other aircraft using their gunner rating versus fighters they may only attack when they're disadvantaged or tailed. Now, we hit the gunner over here, but we didn't talk about it because we were so lost. Um, it's a burst rating limiting in my sights and or out of the sun cards that can be played, but they can only be played if you're disadvantaged or tailed. You have to be engaged and have somebody on you, um, as opposed to you you being on them, <laughs> in order to use the gunner card. But it does give you a chance to shoot at someone when you're disadvantaged, which is pretty cool, honestly. I have never played with a gunner in the game, and, but I can imagine it would be incredibly powerful. Um, and if you think about the World War I games where there's a, 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 a tail gunner, not a tail gunner, but a, a rear gunner um, with a swivel gunner or whatever, eh, wow, you know, <laughs> like think about the Bristols and whatnot. Yeah, they're really dangerous. Um, turret fighter wingman play normally. Yeah, because the wingman is just a wingman. All right. So, when it's your turn, you're allowed to initiate an attack. Uh, for your leader or wingman to attack an enemy aircraft, you have to play a card that has an effect listed in the attack section. Uh, you may attack only one enemy aircraft per turn. Maneuver, half loop, scissors, vertical roll, full throttle, and clouds are attack cards you can play in order to change either your altitude or position against the enemy. Once you're in position, i.e. at the same altitude as an enemy element and either neutral advantage or tailing. 
under normal conditions if you have a gun or otherwise. Uh, you can play in my sights or out of the sun cards, fire bursts, up to the number of bursts you have. Whether or not an attack card play is successful, you can then play another appropriate attack card. That can be a maneuver card. You could try to change position to get more bursts in or whatever. Okay. But a leader can't exceed his burst or gunner ratings uh, as modified but during his position during the leader step. Uh, so the maximum number of bursts you can use during a single turn is your gunner rating plus your burst rating. Um, I, I'm sorry. It's your gunner rating plus your burst rating if you're disadvantaged or tailed. And... Yeah, okay. So the maximum number of shots you can totally fire is your gunner rating while you're disadvantaged or tailed, plus your actual burst rating, which is your normal fighter rating, plus up to three if you get yourself into a tailing position. Now, you can start the turn, be disadvantaged, fire your gunner, and use his bursts, then do some maneuvers, getting your plane into position so that it's now tailing the enemy, and then you can fire your burst plus three. So you can throw a lot of firepower out. You probably won't have that much in your hand, though. Now, whenever you're a target of either maneuvering or firing attempts, you're able to play a response card that cancels it out. The card has to indicate, so for example, this gets rid of in my sights, tight turn, or maneuver. I can play this response card to cancel one of those actions. Then the attacker is allowed to play a response to the response. If he has a response card that lists tight turn, he's allowed to play that. Let's take a look at what some of them, uh, what, what these do. So an ace pilot card can respond to any attacker response card, cancel anything out, including an ace pilot. A barrel roll, and, and these are sort of like the wild cards, right? These are the I can stop anything, and the only thing that can stop them is an ace pilot. Uh, a barrel roll card responds to another barrel roll or an in my sights card. So it's an attempt. The first one would be an attempt to get out away from some firing, but you can follow it up with a barrel roll, like the attacker can use a barrel roll to cancel out uh, the barrel roll. Chop throttle, not used to this, this is new. Um, it responds to another chop throttle or an in my sights card, but it can also respond to a full throttle card, but only if you're neutral, disadvantaged, or tailed. We don't know what a full throttle does yet, and that's important because people have counters for them, so let's jump down to that. A full throttle card or counter responds to an in my sights card, a maneuver card, or another full throttle. Hmm. That doesn't really help. We don't know what a full throttle does. I want to see what it does, because it's something that has a counter, and it, this really should tell me. So hold on. Remember I was looking for the colors to talk to you about? So a card that's blue on the left is just a response. A card that's red on the left is just an attack. A card that's white does both. Here's a full throttle. So again, it has the responses listed, great. But what it didn't tell me was what it does. It improves position by one toward neutral if disadvantaged or tailed. So you're able to basically use your speed to get away from the enemy and put yourself in a neutral position. You can't change who you're engaged with in mid-turn, if I recall correctly. So I couldn't full throttle, get myself into neutral, and pick a different target. I have to stay with that same enemy uh, that's been firing at me. But if I end up neutral and I start a new turn neutral, then I can choose a new target to maneuver against. And that's important because, um, well, for a number of reasons. <laughs> but uh, as the attacker, uh, I'm doing, well, as the active player, I'm doing something and forcing the enemy to maybe play some cards, use up some of their hand. Uh, it's 
kind of to my advantage to keep dealing with them. But there might be someone who's already been picked on and had their hand pillaged. And then, you know, if I'm already engaged with someone, I'm too busy with that person to go pick on someone who's, you know, being molested by someone else. If that all makes sense. And I'm sure it doesn't. Okay, so we found the full throttle. That was the special card that we have. Agile is also interesting. That allows scissors. That's, I believe, just a response card to scissors or tight turn. Let's go back up. Uh, tight turn response to in my sights maneuver or another tight turn. Um, so the chop throttle is allowed to respond to a full throttle, right? But only if you're neutral disadvantage or tailed. So what's going on there? Let's look at this. So if a full throttle is being used as an active card, the enemy is trying to pull away, chop throttle is not going to do shit against him because you've got the advantage at that point. But in a response, let's say uh, I'm firing at you. Yeah, it's... <laughs> So it's very unlikely that chop throttle is going to be used against a full throttle because, let's see, if, I full th if I'm shooting you, and you full throttle, I've probably got the advantage on you. But here's the thing, maybe there's a gunner, right? <laughs> which complicates everything, so the picture becomes completely different. So the other person uh, could be, uh, the response could be coming from the person who is tailing, and they could chop throttle, slow down, and, and prevent the attack or something along that line. Obviously, uh, since the full throttle can be used to cancel a maneuver, and that would possibly be such a case. Okay. And also, yeah, so also if I, full, if I full throttle to get away from you and get it towards neutral, and you full throttle to chase me, then I can chop throttle and end up in, in a position that's, uh, you know, towards neutral. Okay. All right. Uh, scissors response to scissors or tight turn. Vertical roll. This response to an in my sights card, an out of the sun card, or another vertical roll. Yeah, but vertical roll is going to be a white card. And, and some of these others may be too. And that... It's kind of annoying. I, I think the game was better at explaining the cards in the original version, but I'm not sure. But the cards are very good at explaining the cards. Uh-oh. I got a battery issue. If you just want to set up and get playing, you don't want to be watching this video. You really don't. I'm sure you left already. All right. Um, full throttle counters work just like the cards, even, even when loaded. Yeah, I think... Uh, Maybe there's something where if you have a bomb load, you can't use full throttle. Again, that'll be in the campaign rules. Uh, but here you would be allowed to. All right. So there are five relative positions planes are allowed to be in. And let's take this BF-109 and this thing. All right. This is the tailing position. This will give you plus three bursts to fire on uh, the enemy. This is advantaged. This will give you plus one burst to fire on the enemy. Obviously, then there's the opposite situation, right? And then this is the neutral position. Um, either side can fire from the neutral position, but you get no bonus to your bursts. Now, if you're in this position, the hurricane here can't fire because it doesn't have a gunner and it can only use its normal bursts when it's, uh, 
when it's got the advantage. A Soviet hurricane. Okay. Again, I'm going to have to sort all these fucking cards. Um, you play cards to change your position. You play a maneuver card. That'll change your position from by one position from tail. Oh, so here they do explain them all. They just don't have the cards consolidated, which that's fine. Uh, is it? Yeah, because this is the response section. This is the attack section. Okay. Um, so the maneuver card will improve position by one from tail to disadvantage, disadvantage to neutral, uh, across the board. You can do any any one point. Um, improvement. Half loop improves your leader's position by two. Um, but it can't be used to change position by only one. So you can't play it when you have the advantage. Because that would send you above. Whoops. Okay. A full throttle uh, played as an attack will improve your leader's position by one from only from tailed or disadvantaged towards neutral. It can't be played if you're already uh, if you're neutral advantage or tailing. A scissors uh, will improve your position by two from disadvantaged to advantaged. It can only be played if you are disadvantaged uh, or if you're attacking an enemy lone leader that is disadvantaged. Or that is advantaged. I'm sorry. Uh, that is a special case that we get to later. A clouds card. Now this is totally new. Uh, played as an attack by your leader will change its position to neutral regardless of the starting position. If played during the last turn of the game, your element must immediately and automatically disengage. Otherwise, place a clouds marker on the leader's card to show it's in the clouds until the altitude step of its next turn, at which point the marker is removed. Now, while you're under clouds, several restrictions. You must immediately select an altitude at which you will end your next altitude step by secretly playing the appropriate marker face up under your leader's card. Normal restrictions will apply as to what happens when you change altitude. You cannot but you haven't done it yet. You're just plotting a change in altitude. While you're in the clouds, the other guy can't see you, doesn't know what you're doing. It's being secretly placed. Uh, you cannot play any more cards during your leader step, and you skip your discard draw and wingman steps. This is a big deal. Skipping your draw step sucks. <laughs> uh, how can you... Why would you skip your wingman step, though? And, and here's what I'm going to say, because the wingman step happens before the leader step. And you play the clouds card in your leader step. So I feel like that's an error. That your wingman is going to be allowed to do something before you, before you do uh, the cloud marker. Maybe you skip your next wingman step. That seems unlikely as well. Uh, skip your discard district. Yeah, I don't know. Enemy aircraft. Maybe you can't go into the clouds if you took a wingman step. Again, not clear. Enemy aircraft cannot attack your leader or your wingman. In your next altitude step, remove the clouds marker, lift the leader's card to reveal the chosen altitude, and adjust your altitude as appropriate. If you put something illegal in there, I don't know what the hell. You stall and crash. I don't know. Um... A wingman cannot play clouds as an attack card. It is so marked. A clouds card played as a response never causes a positional change. It can be played as a response. I don't know what's up with that. I gotta look. Okay. Well, remember how response cards works. Yes, it can be played as a response. It can re respond to an out of the sun. Hey, that makes sense. <laughs> clouds obscured the sun. Uh, and to respond to a cloud. Remember, though, that a response card just cancels the card just played, so it's not going to do anything. There is an exception to that, though, and we'll get to that. There is something uh, that responds differently. Uh, the vertical roll. If you're uh, 
canceling a vertical roll, I think he may follow the enemy. I, we'll have to get to that. That's going to be in the altitude rules. Uh, okay. If your leader is advantaged or tailing at the beginning of your leader step, you can freely give up your position and become neutral. By doing so, you're free to play cards and attack a different enemy leader, a wingman or a bomber. But you can only play cards against one enemy aircraft during a single leader step, which I kind of tried to explain before. All right. Uh, we talked about what you can fire or not. Engagement. You can only be engaged to one enemy leader at a time. If you're disadvantaged or tailed, you're not allowed to play bursts except with a gunner, or a turret apparently, uh, in which case you may fire upon an engaged enemy or a leader or his wingman. The wingman of an engaged leader may only conduct attacks against either the engaged enemy leader or his wingman. And neither the leaders nor wingmen of other elements can attack an engaged leader except one special circumstance, uh, which is what we were talking about before. It's the scissors situation. Uh, they may attack an engaged leader's wingman, however. All right. If an enemy leader without a wingman is advantaged or tailing, your unengaged leader or wingman at the same altitude can attack as follows. First, your unengaged leader or wingman must play one or more maneuver, half loop, full throttle, or scissors cards until the enemy leader is no longer advantaged or tailing the friendly leader. The enemy leader may respond normally to cancel these out. Once the enemy leader is no longer advantaged or tailing, you may attack him normally Taking him, at, uh, taking an engagement on him now. So you've stripped him away from who he was following by playing maneuver cards and whatnot. If in the course of steps A and B above, you play cards that adjust the enemy's leader per position further than neutral, you gain it as an advantage on them. Or, or tailing. Um, and they've got a note, this is the only time you can play a scissors when you're not disadvantaged, is to screw with um, an enemy leader who doesn't have a wingman. You have to shoot. You can shoot his wingman if he has one. Uh, who is got an advantage on someone else on your side? Altitude. Here's the, what the different markers look like. Changing altitude is a way to shake the enemy leader who's advantaged over or tailing your leader. Your element can climb up or dive down one level. You can also change altitude by playing a vertical roll during your leader step. Only an enemy element that is advantaged over or tailing your leader may respond or follow your altitude change. To change altitude during your altitude step, you adjust your altitude by one level up or down. If you climb, you discard a card from your leader's hand or a full throttle counter. If you don't have a card to discard, too bad, you can't climb. If you want to dive, you draw a card from the deck into your hand, even if this gives you too many cards compared to your performance. If you are advantaged over or tailing an enemy element, you lose that position, return to neutral, and become unengaged. During the next leader step, you can pick a new enemy to engage as you wish because you're unengaged. But there's not much you can, there's nothing you can do. Like if you change your altitude, if you were tailing the enemy and you decide to climb, you've disengaged and there's really nothing you can do anymore. You might be able to pick on, uh, no, you can only play cards against one leader. Yeah. No, no, that, during the next leader step, yeah, the altitude comes before the leader step. So, yeah, it's in the same turn. Okay. It goes wingman, altitude, leader. All right. If you were disadvantaged or tailed by an enemy element, that element may choose to follow your altitude and maintain its position. A tailing enemy can follow immediately by performing the steps A through C. Change the altitude, uh, change the altitude marker, discard or draw a card. An advantaged enemy may follow by discarding an extra card from their hand or a full throttle 
throttle counter, and then they perform A through C. <clears throat> if the enemy element chooses not to follow, it stays at its current altitude and reverts to neutral position, you're no longer engaged. And you haven't played a card in the altitude step, so you can still engage somebody in, in the leader step at that point, if you're at the right altitude. You can only engage someone at the, the same altitude. If either aircraft in your element is damaged such that its altitude exceeds its ceiling, your element must dive during the altitude step. Now, during your leader step, you can play a vertical roll card to change altitude. You follow steps A through E, that's all of it, uh, above, except that any advantage or tailing enemy aircraft that follows your altitude change must discard an additional card in order to do so. Okay, so you don't have to do a ver A vertical roll cancels a vertical roll and keeps you at the same altitude. Um, but if you play a vertical roll, your enemy can still follow you at the cost of an extra card. That could mean if you're climbing with a vertical roll, the enemy could have to pay three cards. One for uh, for follow for for following a vertical roll, one because he's only advantaged on you, and one for the climb itself. Uh, that can be pretty expensive. He might not be able to do that. Uh, an advantage or tailing leader may play his own vertical roll or an ace pilot to stop a vertical roll played by an enemy engaged leader to change altitude. This just cancels it out. It doesn't. Cost uh, count as an altitude change. And this is, again, this is all on the cards. So the cards themselves basically play the game for you. Like, not in terms of making decisions and whatnot, but you don't have to remember all this shit. And that's really important. That's part of the beauty of this game is so much information is just present on the card. And I gotta play with my battery over. We're running low on all the batteries here. And that stupid thing is blinking. It's not good. Okay, firing. Firing is going to be an in my sights or out of the sun cards uh, to score hits on the opposing aircraft. Every in my sights and out of the sun card requires the use of one to three bursts specified on the card. You can divide your bursts into several uh, uh, cards during the turn. As long as the total bursts don't exceed the leader's burst rating as modified by its target, relative position, and other cards played. You get extra bursts and attack and take attack restrictions based on your position relative to the target leader. You can gain extra bursts when attacking a wingman or formation aircraft by playing a maneuver or half loop. We haven't really considered too much attacking wingman. It's a rarity. Normally, you want to take advantage of the enemy uh, the the enemy lead plane for various reasons and. When we play, you'll kind of see why. But there are situations where shooting up the wingman makes sense, especially uh, especially when you have an advantage in planes. So let's say uh, it's two two sets two two elements, which is pairs of planes uh, facing one another, and one of those elements is destroyed. Now, my spare plane can go after, can't really go after the lead element uh, fighter of, of, of your pair, but it can go after the wingman. The one exception being that uh, this situation, if he's advantaged on me, I can play certain cards, including the scissors, to strip him away, but I may not really want to take him away for various reasons, perhaps. Maybe it's better for me to just shoot up his wingmen. But wingmen are very powerful, uh, so taking them on, taking them on is dangerous because you can't deplete their hand is the whole issue. But they have a smaller hand to begin with, so I don't know. Um, If you change positions, you can gain firing opportunities based on that. 
i.e. additional bursts. In general, you're gonna be using your burst rating plus whatever your positional is. So that's gonna be at most burst plus three. But you might, be in a you might be in a disadvantaged position where you can use your gunner first and then change position and use your bursts. Heavy guns are used in conjunction with burst rating. Play, uh, the heavy gun marker has two bursts and does three hits. Now, you can play this in conjunction with an In My Sights counter card to convert that card into this. Two stars, three hits. Wingmen can only use them when attacking against formation aircraft, which will not happen here. The burst requirement to play a converted card is the same as if the card had been the two burst number, yeah. So, this gives you a powerful hit at a high expense of bursts. You may not have as good a card, you may not have the card you want in your hand, but you can replace a different firing card with that. So maybe you have like a three burst card and you can't get to three bursts then you could use this in its place and it cancels it out and turns it into a, a two burst three three hits you might have a shitty one burst one hit card and you're like well three hits will do me a lot more good it'll damage the enemy plane or whatever um, gunners like i said if you're in an unfavorable position you can use the gunner rating to fire and you can use both in my sights and out of my out of the sun um, from a gunner and then they're evaded as normal. Now, there's an optional rule, which I will play with. Decrease position by one when responding to gunner fire. So I'm tailing or advantaged on you. I lose a position point if I try to evade that gunner. The gunner gives you an advantage there. Um, gunners are not allowed to respond to a response. They fire their card. And that's it. The pilot's not able to do anything to make it better. So if I fire um, an out of the sun at you and you throw something that can cancel that, like clouds, too bad. I've missed. <laughs> I, don't, I, I can't play more clouds to counter your clouds or anything like that. Yeah, because clouds cancel clouds. But if my pilot was firing it out of the sun and you play a clouds, I could play a clouds to cancel your clouds. And that, that's just showing that the pilot has a lot of control over the maneuver of the plane. And I've got to do stuff with batteries because this is dying. Okay. Um... Different hits. Aircraft accumulates hits equaling exceeding its damage rating. It flips over and it has different ratings, including a higher number that it has to reach to be fully destroyed. Once it's fully destroyed, it's gone. Uh, in my sights, some hits say cockpit hit. In addition to inflicting a point of damage, you get a cockpit hit marker, which reduces the leader's performance rating by one. And, any, and if you hit a wingman that way, you reduce their offensive rating by one. You can do this multiple times. This used to be like a, a, a pilot wounded or something like that marker. And I seem to remember like rolling a die to see if, he, if he's so badly wounded that he doesn't go back into flight, he retires or whatever. Um, in my sights engine, there was also a pilot killed. In my sights engine hit, I think this re may have replaced the pilot killed. If the target is a single engine aircraft, it's destroyed. If the target is a multi engine aircraft, it takes six hits instead. This makes sense with the bigger, en uh, bigger planes being present. In my sights fuel tank hit, the target aircraft is immediately destroyed. Heavy cannons. If a burst or offensive rating of the firing aircraft has a plus number and the indicated number of hits to the hits is added, 
each time you successfully get an in my sights or out of the sun card plane. So it'll, it's just got heavier guns that'll rip up the enemy plane more quickly. So what about the wingman? The wingman has a whole bunch of special stuff going on. So wingmen don't have their own cards. During their wingman step, they're allowed to attempt to attack. You designate the target, and it has to be somebody you're engaged with if you're engaged. Uh, but they won't cause an engagement. Then you draw a mini hand equal to the wingman's offensive rating, modified by altitude. When the opponent announces he's attacking your wingman, he first plays an attack uh, card. Then you get a mini hand equal to your wingman's defensive rating. Now, let's see. See if we can find a wingman around. <laughs> Here, here's one. So the offensive rating, he'd get one card to attack with. Uh, def defensive rating, he'd get two cards for a potential response. Don't bother drawing unless the attacker can do something to the wingman. Because he might not have anything, he might not have an attack card uh, uh, and out of the sun or, or whatever. Okay. Um, wingmen generally attack and respond in the same manner as leaders, but they have some differences. They're restricted to whom they may attack. Uh, they have no burst limits when they attack. You can play all in my sights and out of the sun cards you draw during your wingman step. When your wingman successfully attacks an enemy leader with a maneuver, half loop, full throttle, or scissors card, your leader's position will be improved with respect to that enemy leader. But those cards have to be, I believe, played within any restrictions. So like a half loop, you still have to have room for the two switches. The scissors, you have to be in the you have to be disadvantaged or whatever. Uh, wingmen cannot play clouds and vertical roll cards as attack cards. If your leader is engaged, your wingman can only attack that engaged enemy leader or his wingman. If your leader is neutral, your wingman can attack any unengaged enemy leader or any leader without a wingman that's advantaged or tailing, or any wingman. The target must be at the same altitude. You always have to hit at the same altitude. Um, if a wingman's attacking a leader, you declare which enemy leader at the same altitude you're attacking within restrictions. You draw your wingman's mini hand. You play the attack card and respond just as with the leader. And you continue playing attack and response cards in the same manner. This can affect position. If the enemy leader does not respond to a maneuver, half loop, full throttle, or scissors card, uh, or your wingman successfully responds to his responses, your leader's position is adjusted according to the wingman. This can bring you to an engagement. Your wingman can bring an engagement on by playing these. If an enemy leader does not respond to an in my sights or out of the sun card, or your wingman successfully responds to his responses, you inflict hits. If a wingman wants to fire at a wingman, Declare which enemy wingman you're firing at, again within restrictions. Draw your mini hand. If you have it in my sights or out of the sun, your opponent must draw his wingman's mini hand based on his defensive rating and altitude. You can play an in my sights or out of the sun and respond just as with a leader. Uh, you continue playing firing and response cards and maneuver cards in general aren't going to help you unless they're also responses to an enemy response. Okay, if a leader wants to attack a wingman, you must have at least one in my sights or out of the sun card in your leader's hands to declare an attack on a wingman. Once you declare the attack, the opposing player draws his wingman's mini hand. Relative position doesn't change the number of bursts allowed. However, you can play maneuver half or half loop that'll increase the number of bursts that you can fire on that wingman. A maneuver increase your burst by one, a half loop by two. This is sort of a one, you know, the maneuver only lasts for this turn on the wingman, but it can clear a problem out of the way. Um, you are not limited to gaining at most three additional bursts. You can get, play like two half loops and add four bursts. Um, when attacking a wingman, the number of bursts your leader may fire is equal to your burst rating plus all the gains you get. Gunners versus wingmen. 
A gunner can attack an enemy wingman only if that wingman's leader is advantaged over or tailing the gunner's attack, which would allow you to attack the plane. If your wingman is shot down, its card goes off to the side and accounts for victory points. When your leader's destroyed, you discard your hand of cards, you remove all the marker, all the hit markers from your leader card. All hits and damage status of your wingman is now converted over to your leader card. Any aircrew, full throttle, or heavy guns that the wingman still has will go over. Uh, your wingman card goes to the side as victory points. And you draw a new hand of action cards, but you get one less card. This is a one-time thing for having just lost your leader. Disengagement. Uh, there are times when running from the fight is your best choice. You can attempt to remove your element from combat through voluntary disengagement uh, instead of playing cards during your leader step. You draw a card from the draw pile. You find the card under the card drawn column of the disengagement table for this level. Now note, an in my sights with engine or fuel tank or an out of the sun card will destroy your plane. And other things will damage your plane, which could actually end up being, in the case of the In My Sights 3 burst, it could actually end up destroying you if you're already damaged, which you might well be. Um, but then there are level modifiers which change this. So if you're tailing the enemy, you drop down two levels in terms of the damage that you take, etc. Um, there's a number of different factors in play here that can modify that. And then you do the same damn thing with the wingman. <laughs> if your leader successfully plays a cloud card as an attack during the last turn of the game, your element must immediately disengage. We already hit that. kind of think you should be able to disengage from clouds automatically and I don't see it there. Okay. Um, give the difference in balance values as victory points to the lower player val uh, values. You can also use these values to create balanced dogfights. Uh, give one side more elements than the other with each side's total balance values being equal. Give a personal lone leader with no wingman to balance it out. Give a side with a lower balance value a pilot with bonus ratings. These are going to be um, handled in the campaign rules, though. So we will not do that. And that's it. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the core of the dogfighting rules. I don't think... I'll be playing any tonight, this morning. It's like getting on 6 in the morning or something. It's still dark as hell out. Uh, but I've got a lot of sorting to do. i gotta, I got to sort the counters. That's not going to take much effort. What's going to take a lot of effort is sorting the planes so that I can find wingmen for my fighters. I don't know why they're not uh, co-located. Uh, that... I find really, really disturbing. So that's going to actually take me quite a bit of time. Um, an unexpected factor in this. But yeah, and I'll send this up and... <laughs> Finding the gunning rating, gunner rating was really, really hard and it all had to do... You know, if this picture didn't exist... I probably would have seen it. I probably would see it. Although, you know, the planes I was initially looking at just didn't have them. But I would have expected them not to have it. See, seeing this double red marker here would be obvious. If I wasn't looking here at this damn little arrow going to the bomb, I'm still... I can see the line heading here, barely, but only when I zoom it in with the camera and whatnot.
this is uh, not not sufficient as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, There's nothing on the back here. All right, let's send it up.